Okay, we are live. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Virgil Moorhead, Jr. I'm part of the Big Lagoon Rancheria, which is Yurok and Talawa. I'm also the Behavioral Health Director here at Two Feathers, and we're live on our Two Feathers virtual Indigenous Speaker Series, and we have two wonderful guests that I'm excited to introduce. Before I introduce them, I just want to pay honor and respect to the land that uh, I'm currently on and Two Feathers is on, which is the Weyot uh, people. And so I wanna uh, pay respect to, to, to their land. And uh, also I want to, to pay respect to all those that are, that are fighting the good fight on the front lines for social justice and, and for our you know, brothers and sisters of uh, African descent and, and know that personally myself and Two Feathers as an agency stands in solidarity with all of you. And so uh, on to our guest. Uh, I'm happy to introduce both of our guests today. Uh, the first uh, one I'll introduce is Patricia Gonzalez, Dr. Patricia Gonzalez. Uh, she is a traditional midwife, birth attendant, traditional herbalist, indigenous scholar who teaches courses on indigenous medicine. She has a doctorate in mass communications and she's a professor at University of Arizona She's wrote numerous books, uh, one being, uh, which we're gonna focus on today, Red Medicine, Traditional Indigenous Rites of Birthing and Healing and Tradition. Uh, and the other book that we might focus on too is uh, Traditional Indian Medicine, American Indian Wellness. Uh, and our other guest, uh, Ruby Tuttle, is Yurok Karuk, Maidu, and Yuki. Uh, Ruby is a respected local Northwest California cultural practitioner. She's trained in indigenous birthing and wellness practices. She's a mother. She's also a good friend of our family and my partner. And so uh, welcome both of you. Uh, Hello. <laughs> yes, thank you for having us. And so uh, we'll get right started into it. Uh, you know, uh, my first question uh, will be for you, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, and that is uh, one of the things that, that you uh, have said and talked about is, you know, the documenting or I have, the focus of your work is documenting traditional knowledge and elders uh, and uh, the use of herbs and the use of uh, look or, or and looking at uh, the ways that birthing is a ceremony. And so my question, my first question is, is during these times that's going on in our society right now, world, worldwide, how, can, how do you feel like uh, traditional knowledge in, in, uh, can help us and, and as not only indigenous people, but just our society? Mm. Well, thank you, Virgil, Dr. Moorhead. Um, thank you to the peoples there also of your place there and uh, honor your rivers, your, your waters and um, all those, um, the powers that are your medicine there and in the place that, that you live in now and where Two Feathers is um, located and the peoples there. Um, <clears throat> you know, back in 1992, we were all protesting and I was part of a, a lot of gatherings with youth and elders and elders from around the Americas uh, because we were really talking about, um, you know, we have survived and, and how this was, people were celebrating, you know, Columbus and indigenous peoples really took control of that story and were knocking down statues of Columbus all over uh, the Americas or, or attempting to and, um, and got lucky in a couple of places. And, um, and what the elders told us then was that um, we had survived and that we needed to recognize this day as a time of survival and also a time to remember what really happened, you know, for us to reclaim the truth. And I think truth is a powerful medicine. Um, and then, uh, and to, and it was, and we were given that task at that time um, to really take on knowledge that would help us to survive. Because at that point, the elders were sharing all kinds of prophecies about what was going to happen, and many of them have come true. You know about how climate, uh, the climates would change, about signs they were seeing with the trees and in water and among the fish, and so um, and so. Really, we were so, so. That's when a lot of us, and even before then, I think back in the '70s when uh, there was another period, and '60s when there was a period of turmoil. But certainly, 
when a lot of us as red and brown people were um, emerging to really um, publicly um, make our voices heard, uh, there was also a lot of, I remember people talking about that as a time when, again, we were the young people who were instructed to learn, learn knowledge that would allow us to survive. And that was really going back to our teachings, but also how do we take our teachings into the moment of, of, of that, you know, because we're always changing as indigenous peoples. And so how do we take that knowledge into this moment wherever we're at? And we see that now again, I'm, uh, I'm 61 now and I see uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of the elders that I knew uh, from uh, old Mexico, um, elders here from the United States, you know, they've walked on and um, it's a world, it's a, it was a very different world that they brought to us. You know, they were bringing hundreds of years of worlds of the memory from their grandpas and grandmas, just like I have that memory of them now. And now, you know, what is the memories that our young people are gonna be building to take to the next generation, which, because their grandchildren of the little ones are gonna be the ones taking us into this in the next century. So I think we have to have that kind of perspective about what do we need to teach them? What do we need to share? And a lot of it is our values, but it's a connection to our ways. And so um, I do believe, you know, one thing the elders have always said is that our knowledge can come back. And uh, one of the beautiful stories that I have in Red Medicine is with, I spent a lot of time with Greg Cahet, he's a mentor of mine. He's Santa Clara Pueblo and he's a scholar and a scientist and also a tradition keeper. And he talked about how knowledge goes away when we abuse it. Uh, but the knowledge can come back. And I think that we have to hold on to that. That's the purpose of our ceremonies. That's the purpose of why we pray. And even our ceremonies and our traditions that we do is also to change the past. And one of the real important teachings that I have is that we can change the past, meaning we can change the hurt. We can change, and I think that goes to like the work that you all do at Two Feathers, um, you know, that our ceremonies, um, the, the, the power of that, those medicines is that we can uh, undo um, harm uh, that is, uh, is, uh, um, ch has changed the way we are, changed the way we experience life, changed, our, changed the way we feel and, or what we can or cannot feel or how we treat each other or how we treat the places, you know, our elements, our grandparents, our grandfathers, our grandmother elements. Um, and that sometimes we have forgotten those things and that's part of the trauma uh, that we uh, were carrying. But, uh, but we can change all that through our traditional ways. And in that way, we change the past. Thank you. And you mentioned, uh, just for the audience that are all tuning in uh, and maybe coming across your work uh, for the first time, uh, you mentioned your book, Red Medicine. And I'm wondering if you can unpack a little bit uh, of what you mean by red medicine. <laughs> red medicine. Whoa, okay. Well, um, so I have, uh, you know, come from um, my, my great grandpa was a Comanche and Nahua from Mexico, and he was a traditional healer. He was a bone setter and an herbalist, and he did ceremonial medicine. And uh, my grandma, my grandpa, they all doctored the family. You know, they took care of the family. They protected them with their knowledge. And sometimes they would take care of the community, the neighborhood. And then my great grandma was a midwife. And so, um, and because of the work that I did, because of uh, being in that, those three generations of traditional healers and then working with other traditional healers uh, over the last, uh, since like 1990, working with, you know, in communities with other Nahua elders in particular, and then a lot of midwives also from old Mexico, like Zapotec, Mistec, uh, Nahua midwives uh, as part of my own training um, um, and being Nahua also, um, I saw, that uh, our medicines could be very distinct, uh, but, but we had, you know, when the elders would come together, these medicine keepers, they would, they would share knowledge and they'd try to find our commonalities, you know, like um, our shared kind of relationships. It didn't mean we were the same, but that there was something that resonated among us, you know, and that was uh, something that, there's something that makes us relatives. And so, uh, so that's when I was writing about red medicine I was trying to um, show how the, the knowledge existed because I would read these books in anthropology and I say, I don't agree with that interpretation. It would make me uncomfortable. And so, uh, but then I would see in ceremony and, and I was like, oh, well, we, we do that ceremony. We still do that ceremony. And, or, but I would see something that they would interpret. I said, well, 
you know, I'm read, I'm looking at it more from my perspective of how the elders have taught me and how my family, what my family has left me. And so, um, uh, and my family are, are my great, both of my mothers on both my sides are Kikapu. And then my, uh, on my grandpa's side were Comanche and Nahua. And they all mixed in also with the peoples of what we call today, Texas that are detribalized. And the original, where would, my family goes back to before it was Texas and Mexico, some of my family. And so I could see these relationships among them. And so I wanted to give it a name that really also represented for what red means. And it, it can have, you know, it's a power and it's, a, it can, it's associated with directions. And of course, each of us have our own direction. So what red means can vary among different peoples. So I really wanted to talk about medicine that was indigenous medicine that has survived all of colonization. And sometimes it survived among the Mexican people and they, they, they couldn't call it indigenous anymore or, or they, they had lost a lot of their ceremonies, but they were doing indigenous medicine in their families. And then other times it was people in their ceremonies, they had red was sometimes in some of the ceremonies, red was definitely connected to women and to birth and to blood and to power and to a particular direction that had all this um, um, uh, influence in our lives. And so that's why I, I then wanted to call it red medicine. So different people trying to find their way back again to their teachings um, could, could understand it through a color uh, could understand it to what that color meant for them and their peoples, but that it really meant that it's going to mean different things for different people, but it's fundamentally the, the foundation. It's an original teaching. Thank you. That makes sense. And so my next question is for you, Ruby, is uh, kind of, you know, you're up in Crescent City right now, which is local, somewhat local to Two Feathers, right? And uh, just wondering about, you know, one of the things, uh, Tracy just said is our medicines are distinct uh, and some of the, the, they've survived. And so just giving uh, you an opportunity to, to talk about some of your work uh, and some of the, the practices that are local to our communities up here that you think help our people survive and thrive in these times. Well, thank you. And um, so I'm here at a village place called Inlet Den. It's where we live. It's right next to the water. It's right next to a lake. Um, and I really resonate with everything Dr. Gonzalez was saying in that our cultural practices are with us always. Because here, a lot of our cultural knowledge was lost with the genocides that happened here. We had one of the largest massacres in the United States happen less than 10 miles from where I'm sitting now. 400 and some odd people, a whole people were decimated there. One of the peoples that I come from, the, the Yuki people, 97% of them were murdered. And so most all of our practices were lost. And so that's been my journey, you know, and it started with my parents and their generation when they worked on the cultural revitalization of our brush dance or healing ceremony for a child, for a baby. Um, and they helped to bring that back when the high dances came back. Um, and then most recently when our um, coming of age ceremonies for our girls came back, I was lucky enough um, as a young woman to be able to receive not only a Talawa flower dance, but also a Kaduk flower dance. So I had two women's coming of age ceremonies because of where I'm from. And, um, and those put me on this path to trying to find and rejuvenate the idea of what it means to be a woman and what it means to carry um, that power that we have. And, um, and so the, a lot of my work is centered around and started with how do we teach our young women to care for themselves? Because if we can teach our young women to take care of themselves with our local plant medicines and with our local prayer places and um, our local ceremonies, then it will lead them to being stronger young women and that will lead them to being stronger um, women and mothers, which in turn will help them be grandmothers. So it becomes this cyclical um, trail basically that we're following to create um, and rejuvenate all of our, our traditional practices. So one thing I've been really focusing on is herbal medicines for young women and how do we incorporate that into our flower dances to um, 
teach them, you know, how they can care for themselves by going out into their own mountains. And we, all of our mountains have spirits in them, right? So we go out to our place and we go out to those mountains and we ask our mountains when those spirits for the help that we need for whatever herbs it is that we're gathering. And then those girls can take that home and use that to help heal themselves or make themselves feel better or maybe their sisters or maybe even their mothers who weren't taught. Those girls can help break that divide that's happened with the loss of so much of our culture. Um, and I just admire so much that um, Dr. Gonzalez, you were having elders to be able to learn from. We have some elders now, but a lot of our elders, um, you know, went to boarding schools, were um, put through forced sterilization. Um, and, you know, here, especially in Del Norte County, we have many of our families come from are the children of rape. And so we have to heal that trauma and how do we go about healing that trauma, um, but also respecting the families. And so that's been a big part of my work. And so working with these young women and with the herbalism and teaching um, or working on prayer with them led me directly into working with birth because it was the next step. You follow those girls from being young women into being mothers and being a mother myself. Um, I went through, you know, the process of pregnancy and birth and thought, you know, we really need to help our, help our people. <laughs> like we need to do something about this. And, um, and that's where I'm at now is how is integrating and trying to revitalize our cultural birthing practices. And um, like it was said before, it's done a lot through prayer. I can find the small bits of information that maybe this one person has one story that was about birth and another person has another story and, um, and going through and finding other indigenous midwives to learn from and looking at what they do and say, oh, we have that, we do that too. We just didn't know what it meant. We forgot, but it's a, just a matter of remembering because it's all still there. We just have to remember what those practices were. And that's really what I'm working um, with now and working towards now is trying to renormalize indigenous birthing ways. Thank you, Ruby. That was powerful. And uh, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, one of the things that you write about it and a, a big part of your work is, is what Ruby uh, mentioned is, is birthing and, and birthing as uh, the birth process as ceremony. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that uh, uh, process or that uh, your understanding of the birth of a child as ceremony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you, Ruby, for sharing your story. I really appreciate your journey. And, um, you know, I think that I, when I heard your story, I think we've been through this before, you know, uh, when we think about how um, many, many of our peoples couldn't do a ceremony, couldn't practice ceremonies, we had to hide, we had to travel at night, do ceremonies at night, you know, because we could be, you know, arrested and, and tortured and killed for doing our, our prayers, you know, and, and being who we are. And so I want to, I think that hearing your story, I think that, um, you know, we have had to bring knowledge back together from different parts, you know, there, this hasn't, I think that's happened before during these 500 years, you know, and um, so I just want to honor that, that, you know, you're and, and, and that I'm glad that you have those threads, you know, to create the web again, to spin the web again. And, um, and so, um, and, and the reason I think birth is so important to understand as a ceremony is that, you know, when we talk about decolonizing, it's very like, what's that word mean in everyday life, you know? And it's these acts, like what you're doing, Ruby, I just like with uh, your communities, you know, that, that that's really, what it's our finding our power despite whatever our situation is. And that in fact, our power and our knowledge is more powerful than colonization because our power is connected to the universe. And, and so the universe is more powerful you know, and so we are connecting to the universe and that's more powerful than decolonization. And so, and so birth then is a way for us in the most lived kind of experience that we go through. 
uh, all of us have know somebody that's had a baby, you know, or been around a pregnant body, a pregnant, I want to say pregnant woman or pregnant body, honoring those different genders. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so when we think about that, um, you know, what is ceremony even, you know, we have to think about what does ceremony mean to us in our communities and how we could understand that birth is a ceremony. And of course, I have to say, I was an honor that uh, this is not my idea. It's the idea of traditional people. And, uh, you know, I tell the story, that's kind of a long story, but that, that whole story about understanding birth as a ceremony. But when I would ask the elders, you know, because I was training as a midwife and, um, and, and, you know, this, it was, you know, this young, actually neighbor of mine was talking about her births and how she was Apache in Nawa and how, how being pregnant and birth was a ceremony. So she's, I was like, I was just starting to, well, I had been, I had already been learning things, but I was in the in the mid of in mid of going back and forth to Mexico with elders, on learning about that in particular when she said that. So I would go back to the elders and say, "So, you know, Tata and Nana, you know, how are the birth of ceremony?" And they'd be like, "Oh yeah, birth is a ceremony." I was like, "Ah, oh, totally shifted me because I hadn't heard them talk about it, but it was just so within the culture, you know, that it was just like, okay, now, you know, we wouldn't say now we're going to do a ceremony and." light our tobacco we just said okay now we're gonna pray with tobacco you know we it's a ceremony so so now we're gonna have a baby it's a ceremony but anybody didn't say it was a ceremony so i think that's how maybe our elders you know just saw it that way we, they weren't naming it per se you know so i wanted to say that because i think a lot of times we that may be in our communities what that you experience is you know it's kind of hidden in there but if you ask it's like oh yeah well why is it because that holding that thread of life because we don't know the birth is so unpredictable it's often very very safe but we don't know so many things can happen we we have to really just be in the moment and just be praying in a good place for all goodness to come out of that out for that for that baby as that baby comes into the world and so it's just like in a lot of our ceremonies we're praying for something we don't know what the outcome is going to be but we're praying for something and so we have to go and I think about the Hopi who farm here and they're always, you know, the, the prayers they offer, you know, with dry farming for rain, you know, to, to have that faith that the rain will come, that the water will come and the water will be there. And so, uh, so birth, you know, we think about that going into this place of holding, growing a child, how sacred it is. And that in fact, um, all these processes are happening in our bodies when we're carrying a baby. And, and even to the point that prior to being coming pregnant, all of these other things would have happened for us to be able to have a child. Those of us have known what it's like to pray for a child because we want it so bad and, and it's not coming. You know, we're not, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And how we, the angst, you know, that, that, that we have about being able to uh, create that life so we can be parents and, and have that precious life with us. And so even prior to conception, the, 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 the prayers that we put into being able to have that child and what and all we're carrying, uh, you know, um, Nana um, Enriqueta, who's Zapotec, a really well-known midwife who came and taught a lot of American Indian midwives over here when to help re bring back birth here to um, different nations. She said, I remember her, you know, I used to, um, I would sometimes, I, you know, would translate for her and, and go to her teachings. And she said, you know, one time somebody was trying to get pregnant. And she goes, you know, it's like, you have to be aware of what what the what the man is thinking in his state of life when you're coming together to create this life and what's the what's the woman thinking what's what is her state of life when when the, that at that moment that electricity fuses that electrical that light that 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 spark of life then that that ignites the um, the, the coming together of, of of the man and the woman in their in their cells to create that child and so when we even think about that birth is a ceremony, even prior to the actual, uh, so in conception and in preconception, and then, and then we conceive of this child and we're carrying this child in our body and we have, uh, we are in a spiritual state and, and it's a body surrounded by water. A pregnant body is, is largely water and electricity, just like the human body is water and electricity. And so, uh, and in that child is in a, a watery place that has, um, it's a spiritual place because they are hearing, they are connected to um, the way that we, that I understand it from a Nawa way is that we are connected through a light 
a port of light that the elders you know, have talked about. And so the baby's not only being fed by the, uh, in the, um, in, in, with the, um, you know, in the womb between, you, both between in the amniotic uh, fluids and the, um, and also the umbilical cord, uh, you know, that it's, it's, it's being fed through this, um, actually through um, a spiritual uh, cord that connects it to a star or to the sun. And so, and then the baby is, is, a, is connected to all of these other unseen protectors that are in the spirit world, and yet it's in this physical body. And it's in this physical body, hearing all the things, all the words, smelling everything, tasting all those things that the mama's eating, feeling everything that she's feeling. And so when we're in that ceremony then of being pregnant, so we think about birth, and so birth is not just the, the, the giving of life, the going, the going through labor and the baby crowning and the first moment when the baby is able to breathe outside of, uh, outside of um, the, my mama's body, but actually that the whole pregnancy is ceremony, and even after the baby's born, after the placenta is born, it is all ceremony. It's all ceremony until we have those ceremonies that, that honor the baby's place in our community. That baby, we're still trying to keep that baby in this physical world. So when we understand a process that can be years, not just nine months of being in ceremony and that we have to think about what are our ways and how are we supposed to be in ceremony based on our teachings. And I was talking about, listening to you all and how your waters, your beautiful waters that you're surrounded by, like, you have all these teachings that, that can help um, a, a, a pregnant couple or a pregnant woman or a pregnant person uh, to help them understand the sacredness of water and, and how do you treat water? What are your ways of, of treating water? Because that's what that mama is. She is water and light and um, that parent is, is electricity and water and then just the flesh and bones that are forming in that body, all those four elements then and, and the breath uh, of the mother. And so all of those four elements are coming together. And so, um, and so when you ask Virgil about this time of understanding these times, you know, the breath of life, you know, that breath reminds us of how interconnected we are. Right now through COVID, we see how interconnected we are. Our breath could hurt somebody. Our breath could be contaminated by somebody else, right? That's what's happening. We're breathing in or we're, we're, we're being exposed through our eyes and through our skin, which is, uh, you know, all these receptors that are, can, can also um, um, absorb, you know, um, viruses and bacteria. Well, this same skin and eyes and all of, all of that we are, uh, also are, are absorbing um, the emotions and the spirit of another human being and the spirit of a community. And so the importance of understanding birth as a ceremony is how everyone, how, how that pr pregnant uh, being, that person who's pregnant, how can they stay in their ceremony? And how can all the people around them remember that they have got to put themselves aside because that mama and that child are in ceremony. They're in a spiritual place. Creator is right there with them. Creation is with them. And we have to get out of the way for them. And I, I think that's one of the beautiful lessons that, that some of the midwives say in, in, in the book, you know, about giving, they gave this ad to get strong instruction. You got to get out of the way because... <laughs> You know, meaning our egos or whatever, you know, that, and that means that's what we do in ceremony. We know in ceremony, we're not supposed to be at that ceremony. We're not in a good way. You know, we have to change our attitude or we have to remove ourselves till we're in a good way. And those are the kinds of things that we need to remember when that mama, uh, that, that person, that, that couple, if it's a couple together, that family, you know, that they are in a, in a sacred time. It's a ceremonial time and, and that precious life. And if we can stay in that balance, that's how much healthier than that baby is going to be. When that co baby comes and sees the light, sees, is able to touch the first light of day, first breath, it, that baby, if we are, can maintain that kind of, at, that protocol of ceremony as just regular human beings, then we help to create that health, that well-being of that baby, that highest, that that baby come in the highest life as out because it's been surrounded in that kind of a protocol. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that the idea of interconnection and getting out of the way seems uh, so relevant to our times today in the sense of just being more compassionate and caring about others. Uh, and so we have a question from the uh, 
viewers on Facebook. And uh, I think it's relevant to, you know, uh, our local indigenous community. And so my next question as a follow-up to Dr. Gonzalez's uh, great uh, description of uh, birthing as ceremony, uh, Ruby uh, Shoshone Hostler asked uh, it, about our local indigenous birthing process and, uh, and specifically like your thoughts about that and on the, the soft spot on the, the head and what the beliefs are around that. Uh, and just, you know, so uh, really how, again, we can bring it to the local context and, and your understanding of birthing as ceremony uh, in our area. Yeah. Um, I had a couple follow-ups too um, around what Dr. Gonzalez was saying um, that, you know, even our word for, um, being pregnant for carrying a child means to that you are with a blessing, you're packing a blessing. So the idea of becoming pregnant or starting along that journey, you are having to prepare yourself to pack this blessing. So it doesn't just start when the act of conception happens. It starts years before as you start to prepare your body and your mind for these changes that are going to happen and changes to your life because every child brings new changes every time you birth a child, you know, you become a mother again, or, you know, um, and so I was thinking a lot about that and how our connection, like, so we believe here, um, that at the moment of conception in there's a pool of life and all of the spirits that are waiting to come to earth are in that pool. And when conception happens, it's because one of those spirits has decided that these two parents are at the right place and I'm going to go down and be with them now. And so they come down and they're with us and they are surrounded by that water because they're still connected. They still belong to the creator. They still belong to Gwatlesham, to the baby sender. And at any point he can take that back if you don't, if you're not living in the proper way um, for whatever reason. And so that's something we like to think about too is that every decision you make as a birthing person connects, you know, you're trying to show this new being that you are going to be able to take care of it, that you have to prove to that per that new being that you are going to um, be the right match. Cause maybe you just aren't the right match. Maybe that um, didn't work out, not to any fault of your own, but um so we think about that and how the baby comes down. And then even after the actual birth happens, um, for 10 days after the birth, the baby still doesn't belong to you. It belongs to creator. And, um, and so we don't name our babies for 10 days. And at the end of that, um, we'll have a baby blessing where we welcome that baby on its 10th day to the human world. And it finally belongs to the parents or, um, you know, whoever's still there with the baby and the family gets to meet that baby and hold that baby as a human for the very first time. And because the baby isn't a human, we have other practices around that. Like we don't put our babies in our baby baskets. Like I have a baby basket here. Um, they don't go into a baby basket like this when they're first born, they go into a 10 day basket because they're not human yet. And those baskets are guy dudes. They're for, um, they're for human children. And so we wait for that time before we put them in there. Um, and another thing I was thinking of, um, even when I was getting ready to come on and, and talk with you guys was about how, um, so the actual word for birth when the baby finally emerges, emerges is nuilti, which means that you're putting life down, like you're putting life, life is coming forth. And the word also for funeral is so on the other side you're putting your life there so you're being born into the other side because um something that really resonates with me about birth is how as the birth happens you have to make that relationship with death because they're they're the same and you have to face that death and at some point you both have to choose to continue forth with life or maybe one of you chooses to leave um and so having a good and healthy relationship with death too 
um, can really help that birthing person and the family. Um, and it's just, it's right there in our language. It's right there telling us that these two things are basically, the, they're the same, the same type of thing is happening. Um, but in terms of like our indigenous local practices, you think about how your cycle would have happened, um, you know, on around the moon and you would have gone and going back to the water element, you would have steamed to clean yourself, to clean your body. You would have bathed much more um, often than you would have uh, um, otherwise. So you, every time you're bringing water back into your ways of healing yourself and protecting yourself too, because you know the water has a spirit. It, all of all of the different rivers they have their own spirits, and each of the places have their own meanings. Um, and so, when we're thinking about the birthing practices, you know, you get you can get that um, the smoke in the from the burning of our you know our sacred medicines around the birthing person to help them stay in that place to stay in um, that calm place where you're trying to bridge the gap between your human self and um, the spiritual self because you have to completely let go and surrender to the universe to be in order to bring that child forth um, i haven't heard anything specific to um, the area here where I am about the open spot on the head. However, I know that a little further south, north and east of us, so it's, you know, it's everywhere around us. Um, people, the, the belief is, you know, that spot is open and that's where that baby is still connected to um, the people on the other side, the, the spirits there, they're, they're right there with them. They're able to like speak that wisdom into that child. And, um, you know, and so when you talk to your baby, you find yourself holding your baby and talking to the top of their head, but really what you're doing is you're whispering those things into their souls. So you can, um, pass on those teachings to them as they're, um, as they're starting to grow. So they grow up with all of those things, maybe, like here we have proverbs that are said. And so you can start speaking those things to that child so they know all of those proverbs. And that goes directly back to what we're talking about, like the COVID-19, the coronavirus, um, and how that's affecting birthing people now. Because it is the breath, you realize how much power your breath holds. But it's in our language, the word for breath yersh is also your word for your soul so it's the same you're putting every time you speak and every time you put words into the world you're putting your soul out there for everyone and one of our other sayings is everything you put you know kwe nak naige, che nak naige, everything you pack out into the world comes packing back to you so you know you it's important to think if before you open and push out your soul into the world is that what you want pushed back into you and so it's a good reminder for, um, for everyone right now that, you know, you need to be really mindful of everything that you say it has power. Everything um, that you do has power. Um, and actually earlier in this year, I was, a, I was a pregnant person during this time. And I just had a newborn eight, um, eight weeks ago. She's eight weeks old now, but um, so figuring out how to work with that and how do I protect myself and protect my child and, um, and protect my space. And that same idea of not letting the fear in and having to um, be in prayer a lot. And it's the idea of really taking yourself seriously as a ceremonial person. And as you know, and if que not questioning, but knowing um, that we believe and that we know that the creator will take care of us. And the way we know that is through prayer. And, um, and so I found that to be really true for myself, that I was a lot into in prayer and um, in a meditative state a lot more um, during the pregnancy period because I had the opportunity to really think about how everything in this world was affecting my child. 
Thank you. You said many powerful uh, mm. insights, and I just wanted to turn over to Dr. Gonzalez. If you had any thoughts or uh, reflections on what Ruby just said. Uh, uh, I just really enjoy hearing Ruby talk. I, a lot of things that she said resonates with, you know, my, my teachings, you know, I mean, in diff I mean, uh, in a, you know, a little bit of a variation, but um, <clears throat> you know, this, this, this spirit, you know, connection that we have it's a spirit point here is really important and um and so when i was talking about that cord it's like a, a you know it's not something we see but it's a it's going up there you know it's connecting to that spiritual world and um and in fact um they say that when you have a when a baby has a really big pot now they're really they, they could or if they have more than one the whirly burlies actually you know that they there could be people who are seers or they could work with medicine. Um, and that, you know, when, when we talk about, uh, sometimes about the tradition in Mexico, old Mexico or all, all over the South where they push up on the fontanelle, you know, it's a ceremony that's done. That's because the, that has fallen in. And that's a connection to um, the stars for us. It's a connection to the stars, but to the spirit world and the stars. So I think I, what I hear from you is I, you have a lot, there's a lot there that um, really can, uh, that is very, um, that's really blessing work that you're doing that um, can help you all. Because I know that Virgil and I were just talking about how to, yeah, we're all trying to bring back our knowledge. You know, we're all trying to bring back birth because birth was one of the big ceremonies taken from us, you know, and all over Indian country. And, um, and it's, I think it's really significant that there's a surge, you know, there's a surge because it's like at the point of life, bringing that back and bringing our foods back. And so um, what I wanted to say, um, just kind of to, uh, to talk about that, because you all live in a place with a lot of medicines, you know, you have like, I can't even imagine your, oh, your we were talking about your, your different acorns, right? And, and your berries and was it berries we were always talking about? Yeah, and then of course you have, uh, you know, really, I want some, probably some salmon that I'll, I hope one day I can taste, but, um, so all of those things. So when a woman or, or a person's pregnant, um, the primary medicine for them is through their food. Because we, we have to be careful. You have to be with someone who really knows herbs, has a relationship with herbs if we're gonna give them something herbal along the way, especially in that first trimester. So most of the food, most of their medicine is gonna come through food, through prayer, through being out actually uh, like if, if, if with anxiety, actually going to the water, actually going to the trees, actually going, breathing in the air, you know, with all the medicine is there in your places. Um, and, and that is really, it's that, it's a very much the physical external world that they're gonna get their strength from. So having, um, having access to these original foods is really a real important component of bringing back health uh, and, and balance to a birthing. And so I would think that, that I wanted to say that's a, a really important uh, thing to remember. Um, you know, one thing that, that Ruby said to me about um, how you have to go by this, you live by this place that was, you know, this a, a massacre, you know, and I'm, I can only imagine what that's like um, growing up there, you know, um, <clears throat> and knowing that happened and knowing they were your relatives, you know, the people that you, you are, the, de the descendants that you carry their blood in you. And, and so I think that one of the things important to remember is uh, the trauma that can impact birth, you know? And so it's really important for us to do a lot of work prior to a, a person going into labor so that that doesn't um, have a, an impact on them because birth is such a spiritual process, you know, as Ruby knows. And one thing that can be in your mind can really stall, you know, can be contribute to the birth not progressing or, or to the, the, you know, or to struggle, there could be struggle. And if they don't have a good diet, that could contribute to struggle too. So really making sure that they're fed well before and after birth, during, 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 during pregnancy, during the labor and postpartum. All those, there are foods that we can give during labor that can give them the nutrition that they, that they need. So they have that life force to go, because there comes a point sometimes where you feel like you can't keep going. So really having those foods available for them uh, would be a wonderful gift for them. Like if you're trying to give them a gift for uh, like instead of a, a baby shower is to give them good foods to rely on during that time and then postpartum, you know, so that, um, so that you have really, uh, the milk is really healthy also. 
Um, but one of the things important to understand with trauma and birth is that when a, when a mom or a pregnant body has a, a trauma, especially if it happens during birth, uh, pregnancy, then you have trauma for both the baby and the mama. And if, um, for instance, if a mama is going through some domestic violence or a person, a pregnant, a pregnant uh, person is going through um, domestic violence or any kind of violence, emotional violence, uh, that it, the baby's going through it too, you know? And it's pre, and of course it's a point where they can't, they, in pre-verbal stage where they can't, won't be able to later talk about why they feel the way they do, but they, they'll have reactions for a reason. And so uh, it's really important that we have ways of uh, helping um, them go into their bodies and pray and center and 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 release. Uh, even they're not necessarily directly dealing with the trauma, although there are ceremonies that can be done, but at least having them to be able to release the emotions they feel around things that have happened to them in a safe way and, and checking in with them. Um, and, and so I think that, so, so let's say post or pre, uh, not, not when someone's pregnant at this time, but let's say helping people to prepare prior to or after birth uh, with trauma, I think is really important uh, because it's, of course, I am not a psychologist, but I have worked with a lot of people in trauma. I've worked with, I'm a trauma survivor. Uh, my family survived, you know, massacres ourselves. Um, we have all the daily traumas of the oppression that we live with that are my, what are, whether they're microaggressions or just, you know, this, the ongoing accumulation of things. So how do we help people to remember their potential, you know, the possibility of life? So that's again, where our ceremonies come back, where our cultural traditions help us, our ways, our, our ways of, of, of how, how we are as people or being with our elders, you know, being with whoever, uh, whoever is still in our communities that are, um, you know, have that, that way of being that an elder acquires from having lived life, you know, that, that is medicine in itself. And so I think that um, we have to uh, find ways to find the possibility in our, in our teachings. And that's one, one thing that a, a, one of, a chief taught me once um, about when we're working with our people, we have to show the possibilities, you know, because we do carry a lot. And so, um, so when, when, so going back to being pregnant, then um, one of the most important things I think to instill in a family that is pregnant or a couple or a person who's pregnant, our mama, is no matter what they're going through, they are in the ceremony of life. You know? No matter what they're going through, they are in the most sacred process of, of, uh, of knowing themselves of, of, of knowing another being that they carry within them. And no matter what happens, they are, they are sacred, you know, and they are in the highest, they're in that highest potential of life at this moment, as they're in this period of pregnancy. So that no matter what they're going through to help them feel less burdened, to remember they are the ceremony, you know, they are the prayer you know, and they are, they are really um, at the highest place that they can be for their people at that moment while they're pregnant. And uh, because sometimes they're gonna feel burdened, maybe, maybe, they don't, maybe they're not ready to be a parent or maybe they're, they don't feel like they can because they, they don't have, you know, they don't have everything they need, you know, or they don't, they don't have a loving partner or there's something discord in the families or, or you know, just all of so many, there's so many human reasons that they can feel unworthy or, or like they can't do it. And so these are the times when we need to give them those words and be surrounded by people that remind them of that power that they have and the power of life and, and, and this, this, that they are in, um, they really are carrying a high, they, they're carrying a high, um, high medicine. We have high medicine and that high medicine cannot be bottled. It is something that can only be lived with our peoples. And if just if they can remember that, how they're connecting and carrying that forward, I think it will give them the strength because we have to help find ways to give them strength. And so that's why the different things we do that gives us strength and, and to help them find ways so that they can become centered. So whether it's you know, working with your weavings or you know, beading or what, whatever the traditions are, where we know we go into another place when we're doing that and we have to be in a good state to give them those kinds of things that can help them 
shift away, shift away from the pain and suffering to, uh, to that creation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and one of the things that comes up as you just talked about, and also uh, what you talked about in, in your book is the natural loss. Uh, and, you know, I know you've done a lot of work with different medicine people from many different backgrounds, many different traditions. And so, you know, we have to be careful with sort of homogenizing and say all medicine people are this way, but, you know, because there's distinct knowledges, distinct ceremonies, but my question as a follow-up is like, uh, what are some of those natural laws that you found, some of those uh, commonalities uh, across traditional indigenous knowledge that maybe you can uh, share with our uh, audience? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Yeah, one time um, was I had the honor of um, <clears throat> introducing sheep or and lions, and I gave him red corn. It was heirloom red corn from old Mexico, and um, he looked at it, and I think it was the best thing I could have ever given him. I mean, what do you give sheep or and lions? You know, <laughs> and from all the Naga Nation, you know, faith keeper, and and uh, and he said, "This is medicine," you know, and he says that. Um, you know, the seeds are natural law, you know, the seeds are our sovereignty, you know, our seeds. And so um, I think that part of natural law is understanding the importance of our, of our seeds, you know, as containing um, <clears throat> all the teachings that we need to understand. And I think it's because to grow food um, are so many relationships. So one thing I think is to go back to our understanding our seeds and that the seeds will teach us what we need to know about natural law. Um, <clears throat> LaDonna Harris, who was, I used to go to, we used to go to Comanche class at her house. And I always love that, you know, we talk a lot about um, having respect and and, you know, you can, you know, there's different ways to have respect. Sometimes it's maintaining harmony. So, you know, part of natural law can be that way to find harmony uh, among our, our, you know, how do we, you know, harmony doesn't mean there's not conflict. It can mean that you're courageous too, to say something you need. So even these words in English don't quite translate. But uh, I always love that she talked about um, <clears throat> that, you know, aside from being, having reciprocity and not taking more and that, the, that when we decide not to take more then that act is, is reminding us that we are maintaining the balance, you know, by the, what we don't do, you know, that's also the balance of remembering that's how we do maintain sustainability. And, you know, it's like by what we don't do and what we remember not, you know, that, that we, what we refrain from, you know. But she said, you know, one of the most important things is to be redistribute, redistribute our wealth and how we, when we have extra, we, or we, we, you know, those extra, you know, when you're a farmer, you you you, you plant extra food because you know that either the squirrels or the deers or the rabbits or who knows what's going to come and eat it, or, you know, around your in, in your land. So you always make more for them because, you know, it's a way to maintain your food base and offer to them and recognize that that's that relationship. Um, but then there's that, you know, that we have so much. We that's we why we give away so much because we don't need it all, and then we allow that wealth to be, you know, distributed among the people that need it the most. Um, <clears throat> I think that one thing I've learned and yes, you know, Virgil, I sent him an article that I just, that just came out last week, but um, you really can't buy, people might buy some of our knowledge, you know, they, they might acquire it somehow, but they can't buy the relationships that we live with that have had over time. And it's that those relationships over time really that are part of that natural law that we have to think about what were those relationships over time and then they they help us to understand what natural law is, is in our in our communities. Those be a few things. Thank you. And I, I see uh, we're about at one. I'm wondering uh, if if we have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, maybe like one or two. How does that sound. Ruby, does that sound okay? That sounds okay. 
Uh, Dr. Gonzalez, can we take a couple uh, questions from the audience? Yeah, sorry, I don't have good audio on my computer. So are you able, you, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Okay. It's a little muffled, but you know. So, so uh, you know, one is the sort of, uh, to turn it to, to Ruby is the sort of, you know, with natural law and, and commonalities uh, uh, around, because we have different distinct indigenous groups in this area. Right, whether it's the Talawa people, the Iraq, the Karuk, and uh, uh, many others, uh, and so I just wanted uh, to see if in in the audience to see if you had any thoughts as a follow up around what uh, Dr. Gonzalez just said, uh, at least for the the local context, Ruby. Yeah, I think um, one of the first things that comes to my mind is the redistributing of your wealth. You think the old stories always talk about how the headman often would have the least amount of the things like food or whatever was in season. So say it was ducks or, um, you know, time for acorns. Well, all of those people that didn't have enough or couldn't get enough, or maybe there wasn't um, a good hunter in their family, they would then go to that, um, that head man and ask for something. Can you give me some of this? So they would then take what they had and redistribute it down to other people. And, um, and you think about that with ceremony now, and we try to continue to do that as, um, as dance makers and um, ceremony people, you can see that they bring all of their wealth together, whether it's in regalia or food or places or songs, and then you share that with everyone else. Because what you're, you're doing is you're sharing those spirits with everyone. Um, and another thing I think of is one of our um, like natural laws is, um, our, our place. Um, one thing I was taught from my father is, you know, about a lot about like terrace ecology and the fact that when you go to each place, it has its own memories and its own, um, ideas and its own knowledge and spirit. So you have to acknowledge those people and that spirit when you go to that new place and you ask permission to be there if you're harvesting anything you ask permission or whether or not um, this is even a good place for that because maybe what you're looking for you know is supposed to be good for the lungs but maybe the one that grows here is really good for something else and if you just listen to the spirit of that that plant or the spirit of that mountain it'll tell you that it'll tell you um what you need to know. And so because we do so much traveling back and forth, you know, even here in Del Norte County, we go to Eureka all the time, which is about an hour and a half away, or we go over to Hoopa, it's about three hours away. But just remembering to acknowledge that when we travel, we have to acknowledge all of those um, spirits of those places and remembering to reintroduce ourselves when we go somewhere so they know who we are. That's just off the top of my head. Thank you. And uh, one question from the audience is from uh, Santa Fe Days, uh, Annette Anderson. She's uh, hoping that you could address miscarriage and uh, stillbirth. Oh. Uh, and that's my sister. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I'm like, how does she know about this Facebook? You must be on the radar. <laughs> She's in Dallas. <laughs> uh -huh. She's my Cherokee's, uh, Chickasaw sister. Um, miscarriage and, and uh, stillbirths. Um, I, I was uh, similar to what Ruby was saying earlier about um, how sometimes spirits, our babies don't stay, you know, uh, for, for a lot of reasons, I think we have to understand, aside from, you know, there can be biological reasons that are explained about, you know, the body expelling, you know, because for whatever reason, some, for a biological reason. Uh, stillbirth is the hardest one, I think, because uh, you carry that baby with you. And there's so many reasons why the spirit may, may decide to leave. And I know that sometimes they just came for that short journey. And um, I've certainly known several people that carried the baby to full term and then um, the baby was born in that way. Um, miscarriages, a lot more, I think they're visiting. And um, for whatever reason, um, not feeling, um, sometimes they don't feel comfortable Sometimes they have like 
they're just checking, kind of seeing the world and seeing if this is where I really want to be, you know. Um, sometimes it can be from mal malnutrition, you know, I mean, there are factors, that can, physical factors, if a mom or a pregnant body hasn't um, had enough nutrition, um, you know, a, a, a shock, uh, if someone is in an accident, it, it can bring on uh, a miscarriage. So this is, again, what trauma can do to the body. Um, <clears throat> and I think that it's important that um, when either of those situations happen, if the mom or the pregnant uh, person, the parent, can experience the, um, the process of letting go of the baby, the releasing of the baby, that can be very healing for them as opposed to an extraction, you know, because sometimes when there's a miscarriage, the, they'll do an extraction or, uh, so allowing the baby to be born uh, is a healing process for uh, the family. And, um, and, and for the body has its own knowledge. So for the, for the body to experience the letting go is really healing. Otherwise it can feel really un, like undone, unsettled, like something hasn't been completed. And then, um, including with a stillbirth, that um, uh, or even when when there's um, when when there's induced labor or they're scheduling a C-section, if if um, that that if they allow for the baby on its own to release itself from the body, that's very healing for both um, the parent and the baby. And so um, it, it it also allows the autonomy of the baby. So they determine, you know unless there's been an accident that's kind of something, some kind of strong situation that's provoked uh, an early labor, the baby is determining, I'm ready now and I'm ready to come into the world. And that's a very powerful impulse for them. They carry throughout their life. And when we try to stop it or we try to push it forward, like with induction, we're impacting kind of that baby's impulse, their innate knowing of when to act. And so uh, similarly, when there's um, mis miscarriage or, um, stillbirth, uh, the, the, when, when um, we, we can have the ceremony of the letting go, that's very healing for the body, for the parent, for the body, that body needs to experience that, that body is intelligence too, and the baby, you know, that they are still going through, they're still around us, you know, to have that experience of being born. Now, when that happens, we have life and death together. So we know that there's death because of the stillborn or the uh, but but <clears throat> the process of going still going through labor and and then releasing the baby is both life and death, and so the body of the 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 mom or the or the parent is going to go through the coldness of of uh, of letting go. Because after birth, birth is a hot experience. You know, you have all this fire. You know, you've been making this baby, and everything in life has been working to create this child and to. And for then everything in life is working to release the baby. And so there's a lot of heat. And the moment after birth, it becomes cold because it's that, that process is stopped. And then if they're in a clinical environment, there can be a lot of coldness because of the, you know, they keep those environments cold for, to, for uh, hygiene, uh, for being antiseptic. And we don't want that cold to go into the body. But then because it's death and death is cold um, and the life is taken, is moved on to someplace else, that can stay around the body. And so then there needs to be ceremonies to help restore heat to the body and restore also the fact that there was death around the body. So how people's teachings are around death also are gonna be part of, part of the birth and part of uh, the postpartum experience for the, um, for the family um, because it will be the family that's impacting them. I mean, anybody that's related to this baby um, is gonna go be going through that grieving. And then we have to um, work with um, the grieving and um, because there's not, uh, be then there's really important to have those teas available to help them to bring their spirit, to ground the spirit, to protect the spirit, the, you know, the, however, you know, your, your medicines are around grounding and protecting and strengthening and bringing heat back to the body is going to be really important. Thank you. And so as the, as we're winding down in the last sort of few comments, uh, well, let's say the last comments for both of uh, you, uh, Dr. Gonzalez and Ruby. Uh, I know that your PhD, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, is in mass communication, and you've done a lot of work around stories and understanding rituals. And 
And I think during these times, it's important to get out a story about indigenous knowledge and indigenous people. And so I wanna offer both of you an opportunity to, for, the, for the audience to hear, what story do you think as a, as, as a way of sort of summing up what we've already talked about or adding to, uh, what story do you think we need uh, to, what stories do we need during these times uh, with a specific focus on indigenous knowledge? Uh, Ruby? I would think that we need to remember um, everything we've gone through and the fact that we're still here as a vibrant, beautiful people, um, you know, from first contact and the diseases and then the deaths and the massacres and the losing of our children to boarding schools. Then, you know, we see all these things that start, that make us think that we're on a decline and we weren't. What I feel like we were just waiting for that resurgence and that started to happen when the ceremonies were brought back and um, and now with more and more of our ceremonies bringing, being brought back, we need to remember our resilience and remember um, that the survival um, that within ourselves is this, um, we have the ability to survive. And as we face these harder times or even times without our families or times when we may feel alone, um, remembering that and that the reason we can bring everything back and or bring these ceremonies back and bring our languages back um, is because they're all still here with us. And it's in those spirits that we can look for for strength and um, and to really um, call upon those because that you know they just they they're there all the time and they're just waiting for us to um, speak to them and to to ask for the help when we need it. So I think that's an, a, um, an important story that we remember to tell ourselves and especially to tell our children that um, you know, we are very resilient people and, um, and that we need to continue to, um, to call upon um, the same spirits and the same places and the same songs that our people have for, you know, for t since time immemorial. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Gonzalez? Oh, I love what Ru Rudy, uh, Ruby said. Ruby, I think you need to write a book. <laughs> uh, um, I would just add, uh, we, stand, um, we stand in the prayers, all, all the prayers of those who have prayed us up. We stand in them every day. And we just have to remember to take a moment and breathe and say, for a moment, connect uh, to the prayers that they've left us. And we stand in that strength. And we have uh, the potential, the, all the power of our medicines, all the power of our prayers, our ceremonies are still there. We just have to find a way to connect. Thank you. Well, uh, we're about out of time. Uh, I want to thank the uh, everybody for tuning in. I want to thank both our guests, Dr. Gonzalez and uh, Ruby, for their time. I uh, Two Feathers really appreciates uh, you taking your time out of the day to share such important knowledge uh, during these times. Uh, I also want to let the audience know that we'll be back at it uh, later in the week on Thursday. Uh, with local uh, artist and poet, uh, Shauna McCovey, uh, local artist and carver, Elmi Allen, and uh, graphic comic artist, uh, uh, Lowry, uh, will be, uh, that will be Thursday at 12. Uh, and so uh, we will uh, be back at it. Thanks for tuning in and uh, take care. <laughs>